Queen Victoria by Giles Lytton Strachey Chapter 4, Part 1 Chapter 4, Marriage 1 It was decidedly a family match. Prince Francis Charles Augustus Albert Emmanuel of saxe coburg gotha for such was his full title, had been born just three months after his cousin Victoria, and the same midwife had assisted at the two births. The children's grandmother, the Dowager Duchess of Coburg, had from the first looked forward to their marriage. As they grew up, the Duke, the Duchess of Kent, and King Leopold came equally to desire it. The prince, ever since the time when, as a child of three, his nurse had told him that some day the little English Mayflower would be his wife, had never thought of marrying anyone else. When eventually Baron Stockmar himself signified his assent, the affair seemed as good as settled. The Duke had one other child, Prince Ernest, Albert's senior by one year, an heir to the principality. The Duchess was a sprightly and beautiful woman, with fair hair and blue eyes. Albert was very like her, and was her declared favorite. But in his fifth year he was parted from her forever. The ducal court was not noted for the strictness of its morals, the Duke was a man of gallantry, and it was rumored that the Duchess followed her husband's example. There were scandals. One of the court chamberlains, a charming and cultivated man of Jewish extraction was talked of. At last there was a separation, followed by a divorce. The Duchess retired to Paris and died unhappily in 1831. Her memory was always very dear to Albert. He grew up a pretty, clever, and high-spirited boy. Usually well behaved, he was, however, sometimes violent. He had a will of his own and asserted it. His elder brother was less passionate, less purposeful, and in their wrangles it was Albert who came out top. The two boys, living for the most part in one or other of the Duke's country houses among pretty hills and woods and streams, had been at a very early age, Albert was less than four, separated from their nurses and put under a tutor, in whose charge they remained until they went to university. They were brought up in a simple and unostentatious manner, for the Duke was poor and the duchy very small and very insignificant. Before long it became evident that Albert was a model lad. Intelligent and painstaking, he had been touched by the moral earnestness of his generation. At the age of eleven, he surprised his father by telling him that he hoped to make himself a good and useful man. And yet he was not over-serious, though perhaps he had little humor, he was full of fun, of practical jokes and mimicry. He was no milksop, he rode and shot and fenced. Above all did he delight in being out of doors, and never was he happier than in his long rambles with his brother through the wild country round his beloved Rosenau, stalking the deer, admiring the scenery, and returning laden with specimens for his natural history collection. He was, besides, passionately fond of music. In one particular, it was observed that he did not take after his father. Owing either to his peculiar upbringing or to a more fundamental idiosyncrasy, he had a marked distaste for the opposite sex. At the age of five, at a children's dance, he screamed with disgust and anger when a little girl was led up to him for a partner, and though later on he grew more successful in disguising such feelings, the feelings remain. The brothers were very popular in Coburg, and when the time came for them to be confirmed, the preliminary examination, which, according to ancient custom, was held in public in the giant's hall of the castle, was attended by an enthusiastic crowd of functionaries, clergy, delegates from the villages of the duchy, and miscellaneous onlookers. There were also present, besides the Duke and Dowager Duchess, their Serene Highnesses the Princes Alexander and Ernest of Württemberg, Prince Leiningen, Princess Hohenlohe Langenburg, and Princess Hohenlohe Schillingsfurst. Dr. Jacobi, the court chaplain, 
presided at an altar simply but appropriately decorated, which had been placed at the end of the hall. And the proceedings began by the choir singing the first verse of the hymn, Come, Holy Ghost. After some introductory remarks, Dr. Jacobi began the examination. The dignified and decorous bearing of the princes, we are told in a contemporary account, their strict attention to the questions, the frankness, decision, and correctness of their answers, produced a deep impression on the numerous assembly. Nothing was more striking in their answers than the evidence they gave of deep feeling and of inward strength of conviction. The questions put by the examiner were not such as to be met by a simple yes or no. They were carefully considered in order to give the audience a clear insight into the views and feelings of the young princes. One of the most touching moments was when the examiner asked the hereditary prince whether he intended steadfastly to hold to the evangelical church, and the prince answered not only yes, but added in a clear and decided tone, I and my brother are firmly resolved ever to remain faithful to the acknowledged truth. The examination having lasted an hour, Dr. Jacobi made some concluding observations, followed by a short prayer. The second and third verses of the opening hymn were sung, and the ceremony was over. The princes, stepping down from the altar, were embraced by the Duke and the Dowager Duchess, after which the loyal inhabitants of Coburg dispersed, well satisfied with their entertainment. Albert's mental development now proceeded apace. In his seventeenth year, he began a careful study of German literature and German philosophy. He set about, he told his tutor, to follow the thoughts of the great Klopstock into their depths, though in this for the most part, he modestly added, I do not succeed. He wrote an essay on the mode of thought of the Germans and a sketch of the history of German civilization, making use, he said, in its general outlines of the divisions which the treatment of the subject itself demands, and concluding with a retrospect of the shortcomings of our time with an appeal to everyone to correct those shortcomings in his own case and thus set a good example to others. Placed for some months under the care of King Leopold at Brussels, he came under the influence of Adolphe Quetelet, a mathematics professor who was particularly interested in the application of the laws of probability to political and moral phenomena. This line of inquiry attracted the prince, and the friendship thus begun continued till the end of his life. From Brussels he went to the University of Bonn, where he was speedily distinguished both by his intellectual and his social activities. His energies were absorbed in metaphysics, law, political economy, music, fencing, and amateur theatricals. Thirty years later, his fellow students recalled with delight the fits of laughter into which they had been sent by Prince Albert's mimicry. The verve with which His Serene Highness reproduced the tones and gestures of one of the professors who used to point to a picture of a row of houses in Venice with the remark, That is the Ponte Realta, and of another who fell down in a race and was obliged to look for his spectacles, was especially appreciated. After a year at Bonn, the time had come for a foreign tour and Baron Stockmar arrived from England to accompany the prince on an expedition to Italy. The Baron had been already, two years previously, consulted by King Leopold as to his views upon the proposed marriage of Albert and Victoria. His reply had been remarkable. With a characteristic foresight, a characteristic absence of optimism, a characteristic sense of the moral elements in the situation, Stockmar had pointed out what were, in his opinion, the conditions essential to make the marriage a success. Albert, he wrote, was a fine young fellow, well grown for his age, with agreeable and valuable qualities, and it was probable that in a few years he would turn out a strong, handsome man, of a kindly, simple, yet dignified demeanor. Thus externally he possesses all that pleases the sex, and at all times and in all countries must please. Supposing, therefore, that Victoria herself was in favor of the marriage, 
the further question arose as to whether Albert's mental qualities were such as to fit him for the position of husband of the Queen of England. On this point, continued the Baron, one heard much to his credit. The Prince was said to be discreet and intelligent, but all such judgments were necessarily partial, and the Baron preferred to reserve his opinion until he could come to a trustworthy conclusion from personal observation. And then he added, But all this is not enough. The young man ought to have not merely great ability, but a right ambition and a great force of will as well. To pursue for a lifetime a political career so arduous demands more than energy and inclination. It demands also that earnest frame of mind which is ready of its own accord to sacrifice mere pleasure to real usefulness. If he is not satisfied hereafter with the consciousness of having achieved one of the most influential positions in Europe, how often will he feel tempted to repent his adventure? If he does not from the very outset accept it as a vocation of grave responsibility, on the efficient performance of which his honor and happiness depend, there is small likelihood of his succeeding. Such were the views of Stockmar on the qualifications necessary for the due fulfillment of that destiny which Albert's family had marked out for him, and he hoped during the tour in Italy to come to some conclusion as to how far the prince possessed them. Albert, on his side, was much impressed by the baron, whom he had previously seen but rarely. He also became acquainted for the first time in his life with a young Englishman, Lieutenant Francis Seymour, who had been engaged to accompany him, whom he found sehr liebenswürdig, and with whom he struck up a warm friendship. He delighted in the galleries and scenery of Florence, though with Rome he was less impressed. But for some beautiful palaces, he said, it might just as well be any town in Germany. In an interview with Pope Gregory the Sixteenth, he took the opportunity of displaying his erudition. When the Pope observed that the Greeks had taken their art from the Etruscans, Albert replied that, on the contrary, in his opinion, they had borrowed from the Egyptians. His Holiness politely acquiesced. Wherever he went, he was eager to increase his knowledge, and at a ball in Florence he was observed paying no attention whatever to the ladies, and deep in conversation with the learned Signor Caponi. Voilà un prince dont nous pouvons être fiers, said the Grand Duke of Tuscany, who was standing by. La belle danseuse latin, le savant, l'occupe. On his return to Germany, Stockmar's observations, imparted to King Leopold, were still critical. Albert, he said, was intelligent, kind, and amiable. He was full of the best intentions and the noblest resolutions, and his judgment was in many things beyond his years. But great exertion was repugnant to him. He seemed to be too willing to spare himself, and his good resolutions too often came to nothing. It was particularly unfortunate that he took not the slightest interest in politics, and never read a newspaper. In his manners, too, there was still room for improvement. He will always, said the Baron, have more success with men than with women, in whose society he shows too little empressement, and is too indifferent and retiring. One other feature of the case was noted by the keen eye of the old physician, the prince's constitution was not a strong one. Yet, on the whole, he was favorable to the projected marriage. But by now, the chief obstacle seemed to lie in another quarter. Victoria was apparently determined to commit herself to nothing. And so it happened that when Albert went to England, he had made up his mind to withdraw entirely from the affair. Nothing would induce him, he confessed to a friend, to be kept vaguely waiting, he would break it off at once. His reception at Windsor threw an entirely new light upon the situation. The wheel of fortune turned with a sudden rapidity, and he found, in the arms of Victoria, the irrevocable assurance of his overwhelming fate. 2. He was not in love with her. A 
affection, gratitude, the natural reactions to the unqualified devotion of a lively young cousin who was also a queen, such feelings possessed him. But the ardours of reciprocal passion were not his. Though he found that he liked Victoria very much, what immediately interested him in his curious position was less her than himself. Dazzled and delighted, riding, dancing, singing, laughing amid the splendours of Windsor, he was aware of a new sensation, the stirrings of ambition in his breast. His place would indeed be a high and enviable one. And then on the instant came another thought. The teaching of religion, the admonitions of Stockmar, his own inmost convictions, all spoke with the same utterance. He would not be there to please himself, but for a very different purpose, to do good. He must be noble, manly, and princely in all things. He would have to live and to sacrifice himself for the benefit of his new country, to use his powers and endeavors for a great object, that of promoting the welfare of multitudes of his fellow men. One serious thought led on to another. The wealth and bustle of the English court might be delightful for the moment, but after all it was Coburg that had his heart. "'While I shall be untiring,' he wrote to his grandmother, "'in my efforts and labours for the country to which I shall in future belong, "'and where I am called to so high a position, "'I shall never cease ein treuer Deutscher, Coburger, Gotaner zu sein.' "'And now he must part from Coburg for ever. "'Sobered and sad, he sought relief in his brother Ernest's company. "'The two young men would shut themselves up together.' and sitting down at the piano fort would escape from the present and the future in the sweet familiar gaiety of a haydn duet they returned to germany and while albert for a few farewell months enjoyed for the last time the happiness of home victoria for the last time resumed her old life in london and windsor she corresponded daily with her future husband in a mingled flow of german and english but the accustomed routine reasserted itself, the business and the pleasures of the day would brook no interruption. Lord M. was once more constantly beside her, and the Tories were intolerable as ever. Indeed, they were more so, for now, in these final moments, the old feud burst out with redoubled fury. The impetuous sovereign found, to her chagrin, that there might be disadvantages in being the declared enemy of one of the great parties in the state. On two occasions, the Tories directly thwarted her in a matter on which she had set her heart. She wished her husband's rank to be fixed by statute, and their opposition prevented it. She wished her husband to receive a settlement from the nation of fifty thousand pounds a year, and again owing to the Tories, he was only allowed thirty thousand pounds. It was too bad. When the question was discussed in Parliament, it had been pointed out that the bulk of the population was suffering from great poverty, and that thirty thousand pounds was the whole revenue of Coburg. But her uncle Leopold had been given fifty thousand pounds, and it would be monstrous to give Albert less. Sir Robert Peel, it might have been expected, had had the effrontery to speak and vote for the smaller sum. She was very angry, and determined to revenge herself by omitting to invite a single Tory to her wedding. She would make an exception in favor of old Lord Liverpool, but even the Duke of Wellington she refused to ask. When it was represented to her that it would amount to a national scandal if the Duke were absent from her wedding, she was angrier than ever. What? That old rebel? I won't have him, she was reported to have said. Eventually she was induced to send him an invitation, but she made no attempt to conceal the bitterness of her feelings, and the Duke himself was only too well aware of all that had passed. Nor was it only against the Tories that her irritation rose. As the time for her wedding approached, her temper grew steadily sharper and more arbitrary. Queen Adelaide annoyed her. King Leopold, too, was ungracious in his correspondence. Dear uncle, she told Albert, is given to believe that he must rule the roost everywhere. 
However, she added with asperity, that is not a necessity. Even Albert himself was not impeccable. Engulfed in Coburg's, he failed to appreciate the complexity of English affairs. There were difficulties about his household. He had a notion that he ought not to be surrounded by violent Whigs. Very likely, but he would not understand that the only alternatives to violent Whigs were violent Tories, and it would be preposterous if his lords and gentlemen were to be found voting against the Queen's. He wanted to appoint his own private secretary, but how could he choose the right person? Lord M. was obviously best qualified to make the appointment, and Lord M. had decided that the Prince should take over his own private secretary, George Anson, a staunch Whig. Albert protested, but it was useless. Victoria simply announced that Anson was appointed, and instructed Leitzen to send the Prince an explanation of the details of the case. Then again, he had written anxiously upon the necessity of maintaining unspotted the moral purity of the court. Lord M's pupil considered that dear Albert was straight-laced, and in a brisk Anglo-German missive, set forth her own views. I like Lady A very much, she told him, only she is a little strict and particular, and too severe toward others which is not right for I think one ought always to be indulgent towards other people, as I always think, if we had not been well taken care of, we might also have gone astray. That is always my feeling. Yet it is always right to show that one does not like to see what is obviously wrong. But it is very dangerous to be too severe, and I am certain that, as a rule, such people always greatly regret that in their youth they have not been so careful as they ought to have been. I have explained this so badly and written it so badly that I fear you will hardly be able to make it out. On one other matter she was insistent. Since the affair of Lady Flora Hastings, a sad fate had overtaken Sir James Clark. His flourishing practice had quite collapsed. Nobody would go to him any more. But the Queen remained faithful. She would show the world how little she cared for their disapproval, and she desired Albert to make poor Clark his physician in ordinary. He did as he was told, but as it turned out, the appointment was not a happy one. The wedding day was fixed, and it was time for Albert to tear himself away from his family and the scenes of his childhood. With an aching heart, he had revisited his beloved haunts, the woods and the valleys where he had spent so many happy hours shooting rabbits and collecting botanical specimens. In deep depression, he had sat through the farewell banquets in the palace and listened to the Freischutz performed by the state band. It was time to go. The streets were packed as he drove through them. For a short space, his eyes were gladdened by a sea of friendly German faces and his ears by a gathering volume of good guttural sounds. He stopped to bid a last adieu to his grandmother. It was a heart-rending moment. Albert, Albert, she shrieked, and fell fainting into the arms of her attendants as his carriage drove away. He was whirled rapidly to his destiny. At Calais, a steamboat awaited him, and together with his father and his brother, he stepped dejected on board. A little later, he was more dejected still. The crossing was a very rough one. The Duke went hurriedly below, while the two princes, we are told, lay on either side of the cabin staircase in an almost helpless state. At Dover, a large crowd was collected on the pier, and... It was by no common effort that Prince Albert, who had continued to suffer up to the last moment, got up to bow to the people. His sense of duty triumphed. It was a curious omen. His whole life in England was foreshadowed as he landed on English ground. Meanwhile, Victoria, in growing agitation, was a prey to temper and to nerves. She grew feverish and at last Sir James Clark pronounced that she was going to have the measles. But once again, Sir James's diagnosis was incorrect. It was not the measles that were attacking her, but a very different malady. She was suddenly prostrated by alarm, 
regret, and doubt. For two years she had been her own mistress, the two happiest years by far of her life, and now it was all to end. She was to come under an alien domination. She would have to promise that she would honor and obey someone who might, after all, thwart her, oppose her, and how dreadful that would be. Why had she embarked on this hazardous experiment? Why had she not been contented with Lord M? No doubt she loved Albert, but she loved power, too. At any rate, one thing was certain. She might be Albert's wife, but she would always be Queen of England. He reappeared in an exquisite uniform, and her hesitations melted in his presence like mist before the sun. On February 10, 1840, the marriage took place. The wedded pair drove down to Windsor, but they were not, of course, entirely alone. They were accompanied by their suites, and in particular by two persons, the Baron Stockmar and the Baroness Leitzen. End of chapter 4, part 1